Hello and welcome to Channels Book Club. My name is Olakule Kasumo and it's great to be on the show. Today is all about a former chief of army staff. Whether it's Major General Kenneth Exam during the days when we only had GOCs or Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowon who was chief of army staff in 1966 or any of the other chiefs of army staff we've had since then, about 25 in number since then, up until the current one, Lieutenant General Farouk Yahaya, chiefs of army staff have always been loved or respected or feared or even despised, depending on who you are. One thing, though, all of us have always held them in some sort of, they've always been mysterious, if you get what I mean. We only know about them from, from the pages of newspapers or, or television or the internet. We never really get to know them. That might be about to change. Nero Adedokun, lawyer, writer, biographer, has written this fascinating book, The Man, the Soldier, the Patriot. The biography of Lieutenant General Ibrahim Atahiru, late, may his soul rest in perfect peace. Nero has written this biography and he has sort of broken a ceiling here because Hardly do we get biographies about chiefs of army staff in Nigeria. Here's one, and it is a compelling read. Nero is our guest today. Let's get to meet with him and then enjoy the conversation with him and get ready to get a peep into the world of Atahiru Ibrahim. Nero Adidoku is a public relations practitioner lawyer, columnist, and biographer. Adedoku is an alumnus of the University of Ilori, the University of Lagos, and the Nigerian Institute of Journalism. He started his journalistic career with Independent Communications Network Limited, publishers of the news, Tempo and PM News, and later proceeded to the Punch and This Day newspapers, where he left as Deputy Features Editor. Adidoku has authored several books, including Ladies Calling the Shots, The Danford Driver in All of Us, and The Law is an Ass. He joins Channel's Book Club to discuss his most recent book, The Man, The Soldier, The Patriot, a biography of Lieutenant General Ibrahim Atahiru. Nero Adedoku, nice to have you on Channels Book Club. Thank you very much for having me. Really it's great to have you. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, really, uh, yeah. We've been speaking for a long time, but yeah. we never just got you here. Yeah. And well done. You've done quite a lot of work. I mean, you're writing over the years. Thank you. Well that's, done. That's kind of you. Yeah. Is that why you are white? So you are great. <laughs> you yeah, because, because I always tell people this one is fake. It's from all the books I read. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think this is natural. It's natural. I started having these, uh, yes, be as bags, so right, yes, bags. So, it looks, early 30s looks, looks good on you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so, this is your latest The Man, the Soldier, the Patriot. What's the story behind this book? The biography of Lieutenant General Ibrahim Atahiru. Yes. Well, um, General Atahiru died at a very inauspicious you know, time, you know, if. if um, you know, you like. Um, he became um, a chief of army staff at the time that many Nigerians did not know him. You know, he just mm. like he just came from nowhere, yeah. became chief of army staff, and then before we realized who he was, um, the unfortunate accident you yeah. know that took him away happened in mm. Kaduna, and so um, he just left. Mm. So there are all sorts of um, stories about who he was, you know, and stuff. And I think most importantly, uh, the wife was also concerned, the wife and some of his friends were also concerned about what history will say about him. Mm. He was a man who kept to himself a lot. People didn't know him. And he also didn't have the opportunity, you know, to show himself, you know, the kind of soldier that he was uh, in the time that he had the opportunity to lead the Nigerian army. He's had a couple of command positions, you know, mm -hmm. before he became chief of army staff. But then, he wasn't the leader of the Nigerian army. As a military man, he was a subject 
to directives, you know, and whatever his bosses wanted him to do. So here, when he became, you know, chief of army staff, he was in a position to um, kind of fold his own agenda, you know. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. So yeah. his friends, his wife, who knew the vision he had for the Nigerian army, felt like it was good to document his life. Yeah. Um, the wife also felt that, look, his children were young. They are young, you know. They really don't know their dad. So yeah, we, I read uh, here that uh, he had them quite... Yes, you know, it, was it was quite, quite advanced. advanced in yes, age exactly. So kids. it would be nice for them to grow up and have something that tells about their father. Yeah, mm. especially their last child who really didn't know him well, you know. So yeah, so that's where this came from. Nero, do you know how much I admire that mentality? Mm. You know, I'm, uh, I have said it over and over. Every way I've had the chance, I said, let's write our history. Yeah. The other people in other parts of the world, one of the reasons why they have had more success in terms of nation building, I believe yeah. very, very strongly, is because they document history. Amongst other factors, of yeah. course. You yeah. Know? Yeah. They document history. Yeah. We don't know our stories. Yeah. So, so the efforts to have written the story, because, I mean, I was reading it. Uh, um, the, when you talk about chiefs of army staff in Nigeria, we hardly know them, except people who are maybe... Um, under their authority yes. in the army yes. or their families yes. and all that. Yeah. The average person really doesn't know. You know a bit about the president. You know a bit about what's the chief of army staff. Hardly, you mm -hmm. know. So when I was reading this, it was it was really great, very insightful. It's helped in terms of education. Yeah. And he was chief of army staff for only about four months. Exactly. Yeah. He before. was appointed in January. He died in May. In May. Mm, yeah, yeah. Now. I found many things interesting in you building up his story, mm. telling his story from when he was very young. There was Rumi Kole, there was NDA. Um, then, you know, when I read that story, I found a lot of things fascinating. One of the one one of the things I found most fascinating was your emphasis on how intellectual yeah. he was. Yeah. You know, the average person thinks of a military man as you know, the guy with the gun and, you know, fighting war and all that. But, of course, you and I know that some military men are very... Yes. But, but you try to explain this part of his story. How, when he was young, he loved to read. And reading was very much part of his life. And then he developed that. And then when he, was in greater, when he had greater authority, he began to imbibe the culture of training and education and all that. Talk a little bit about that intellectualism. Yeah, he was on his way to get to the PhD, actually, before he was appointed as a chief of army staff. So he was, he was really into... He had two master's degrees. Yes, already. You wrote. And his wife told me a story, I, I think it's in the book, that I think her first birthday, after they met, he bought a book for her. Yeah, so I read that story here. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And she was like, which kind of mind is this? I mean, I don't understand. People bring flowers, bring, bring cakes, cakes and stuff. What's book? You know. So he was this kind of person. And one of his classmates in, in, at Rimi College, um, um, retired, you know, in the Air Force, was, was speaking about the fact that the two of them would leave Rimi College and go to the library in Kaduna. There was a neighborhood library then. And they will sit down there and read until like 6 or 7 or 8 p.m. at night and then go back home. Mm. You know, so he has this tradition that everyone who knew him at every stage of his life could testify to. One of his friends told me that, um, Didi Ndiomo, that if you had a discussion with him mm -hmm. and he, wasn't, he, wasn't, he didn't know much about that discussion, if you came to him two days later, you yeah. would be shocked yeah, well, at the amount of information he already had acquired, you know, about that. So it was, and it was also his approach to solving even military problems. You know, so when his colleagues will bring th things, he will read books, he will tell them history of what he had read in the past, you know, about things that have happened in the, in the U.S. military, you know, and other places. Hmm. Yeah, so he was really one of those uh, military officers who didn't take books, you know, lightly at all. So I also found intriguing um, the way you addressed a few controversial things, okay. you know, in his career. Um, for example, um, when he was deployed as the is it commander now yes. of... Um, theater commander. Theater commander. 
of yeah. Operation Lafayette Dole. Operation, yeah, Lafayette Dole. Yes. You know, how, can you explain, talk a little bit about that? I know you probably would like to talk about the more in, uh, exciting part, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's all, you know, he was, he, he, had, he had a distinguished career, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was an infantry officer. At some point, he was pulled to be spokesperson for the army. You know, so he, and then when he was taken to Operation Lafayette Dole, everyone who worked with him testified that he did his best. You know, it was, and things were going on well. Uh, but suddenly, after six months, he was pulled out, you know, and people didn't understand why, you know, and so it's, um, that's the issue. But when he was leaving... To be, to be clear, we're yeah. talking about the operation in charge of tackling the Boko Haram, Boko crisis. Haram crisis. Yes, in Bono State. In Bono State, Bono State yeah. yes, yes. So he was there, he was head of your operator. He took over from the current chief of defense staff. Um, Rabo? The, yes, General General, Rabo. General, General, yes, General okay. Rabo, you know. So he took yeah. over from General Rabo, who had been there for, I think, close to two years or a little over one year before him, you know. And then he was there for six months. And then after six months, he was pulled out. Um, because I think they have had some losses, you know. But people who understand, you know, who follow the history of events, who follow events in, you know, um, the Boko, who follow the Boko Haram crisis, say that there was nothing spectacular, you know, about that particular loss that was said to have uh, accounted for his, his, his remover. You know? Yeah, you, and, you, you wrote about how the former chief of army staff, yeah. you know, issued a directive that he needed to... Um, capture um, the Shekau within a, yes, a, yes, a particular yeah, point in time Shekau, yes, and all that. that uh, yeah. let, let me leave. I, I want to readers to keep wondering what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so I won't say everything. Yes. But what I found interesting was how that particular part of the story revealed some kind of disagreement between him and the former chief of yes. staff. Yes. You know, and then you also highlighted how. Um, when different parts of the military, the like, yeah, you know, the, the air force and the yes, ground forces yeah, exactly. are not really in sync, and how that affects results and all that. Then you went on to explain how, when he became chief of army staff, he solved that problem. You know, so it was insightful for me yeah. as somebody looking from afar. I said, oh, okay, so this is why we have some of these problems at times. Yes, but we don't know that. Yeah. It's only the insiders yeah. who get to know. Yeah. All that. I found that interesting. Unfortunately for him, he wasn't in, he was just theater commander. He couldn't command the Air Force, you know, he couldn't, com com so, so all he could do was with the Grand Forces. But the Grand Forces would need the hair company air, air at every time, yeah. you know. So it became, a, because the chiefs were really, I mean, someone actually said at that point, they were not even on speaking terms. They would not go to the same mosque to pray, you know. And, uh, that was the... Chief of Army Staff and the and Chief the of Air Staff of, and the chief at of that staff. time. Yeah, so, you know, the command structure at the war front, you know, at issue, it was a problem, you know, so, and that led to a lot of defeats that they were having at that time. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, this is one of the reasons why um, I find this book, uh, you know, fascinating. It's not just, it's not just this story of yeah. Atahir Ibrahim, but also provides a lot of insight into you know, the workings of the military, yes. the army. Yeah. And, and, and you notice that it, it changed. In the moment it came, it changed the name of the operation. The moment it became chief of army staff, the operation was um, Operation Lafayette Dole, which means La f force, um, peace by force. Peace by force. But when it came, it changed the name to Adenkai, which is like, let us come together, you know, to you know, solve the problem. Mm. So it was really intent on this, the, the importance of using of every force, you know, including the, the rural, I mean, the civilian population coming together to, you know, to fight this war. It couldn't just be the army and we would expect to win. The, the, I mean, there's, of course, some people are fiercely critical mm. of the way the chiefs of, uh, you know, the military the forces military, yes. in Nigeria have handled the issue of Boko Haram. Mm. Some people are very fiercely critical of that. Um, the, is the fact that he did only four months, you know, is that fact a, a reason for why he has sort of left the stage with some kind of 
you know, unblemished. It's not as criticized as others. Is that is that why? Well, I, I mean, one can never tell. But it seemed like things would. It seemed like even from the testimony of some of his colleagues, like the chief of army staff, or chief of air staff, who worked very closely with him, they felt that he had a direction, and that he would have accomplished more if he lived longer, no, no. you know. So one, I mean, you can't really tell what would have happened, but I've read a couple of stories about people who work, journalists, you know, and civilians who are close to him, who wonder if things wouldn't have changed for the positive if he stayed longer as chief of army staff. Okay. You know, because they were, I mean, some of them just felt like, look, this man, and he had, a, he had an idea of exactly, there was the, there is an issue, there is a, the example of a particular loss that the military had, um, that he gave his, he gave his, uh, he gave his troops 48 hours to, to recapture the territory that Boko Haram captured. And it was done. Mm. You know, so, and from what I learned then, they said he just knew what to do. You know, he also had the benefit of having been theater commander. So it was an area he understood very well. And he knew that, okay, so for us to capture this, we need to do that, we need to do that. And they went after it. So Nero, the way you wrote the prologue, and you dedicated a prologue and an epilogue yes. to the day, the day he died. He died. Yeah. And I found that very interesting. And yeah, yeah. I, I like that. Okay. Because it, it sort of like painted the whole picture, helped me to see what the day was like. Yeah. You know, his... I mean, his regular routines, the people he spoke to, yeah. you know, and so on. And then eventually, even you described, you know, the way things were mm. on board. Yes, I tried to. When the crash was going to happen. Yes. You tried to be yes. creative about the way you described it. Yes. And it made it so real and so touching and so emotional. Uh, what was your thought about, I mean, what was going through, why do you write that way? When I spoke with the wife and... You, you one could see the depth of our grief. Um, some of his friends too, there were quite a number of people who spoke to men who broke down. They couldn't even con conclude the interview. Mm. So I felt like it would be nice to paint a picture of his last day on earth, you know, that so people can at least imagine, you know, the sense of loss that his people have or had mm. at the report of his death. Does this title summarize the legacy of Ibrahim Atahiru, the man, the soldier. And the patriots. The patriots, in your opinion. Absolutely. He loved Nigeria without this. People say it doesn't matter, it didn't matter where you came from, what religious you, I mean, there were guys who were with him that said, they did, he didn't even know whether they were Christians or Muslims, and they had worked with him for 11, 12, 13 years. He just treated people as human beings, without any, you know, coloration without any thinking about where you came from, what faith you had, you know. And so when you look at all of that, um, you, I, I mean, I was convinced, I was convinced that he was really a man who loved Nigeria, patriotic Nigeria, without any doubt. Finally, I had a problem with your cover picture. Okay. Why did he use... The face card. This is my thinking the about face. you. You, <laughs> okay, the writer. Okay, okay, you okay. The, yeah, I said, why did he use the picture of Atahiru Ibrahim with a face mask? Why not a picture that we can all see? And so I had a problem with that cover, okay. that picture you used. Mm. Then later on, I said, hmm, probably you, the, you didn't pick that picture randomly. Maybe you had a message. You know, there's a reason why you picked that particular picture. And of course, it was um, COAS during COVID time. Yes. Huh? Yes. So this is symbolic. Exactly. You know, it's a picture that carries a lot of meaning, mysterious. People really yeah. didn't know him. But it was also someone who followed the rules. So if you had, if you ask everyone to wear face masks as chief of army staff, he also wore his face mask, you know, wherever he went, you know, and all of that. So a couple of things that we thought, and it just felt like, yes, so that it, fitted it was an appropriate picture for the cover. Well done. Thank you very much, Nero, for Thank joining you. us on Channel's Book Club. It's my pleasure. And, and well done. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, we hope to have Nero back on the show. He's written quite a lot and continues to write, helping us to preserve Nigerian stories. And what a great story, the story of Lieutenant General Ibrahim Atahiru 
is. I can imagine how many more stories are out there that we need to learn about. Well, hopefully more will be written, published, and reviewed, the stories of Nigerians. Up next is the Nigeria International Book Fair. There are book fairs all over the world, and Nigeria has its own book fair. It's called NIBF, Nigeria International Book Fair. It was quite exciting, and we were there. Enjoy this. To inform them about what policy... It was themed the role of a functional national book policy in the African book ecosystem, the biggest book fair in Nigeria, a hybrid event started with the international conference where several local and international stakeholders in the book chain participated. Thank you very much. Can we give him a bigger round of applause? In his welcome address, the newly elected chairman of the Nigerian Book Fair Trust, Dario Uluatui, spoke on the major goal of the NIBF. The major goal of the Nigerian Book Fair Trust is to use the NIBF as a special purpose vehicle to encourage and improve the reading culture in our country. We are collaborating with the relevant government agencies, including the Universal Basic Education Commission, UBEC, Special Education Trust Fund, National Library of Nigeria, and the Nigerian Copyright Commission, among others, not forgetting the Nigerian Education Research Development Council who has been our partner since the beginning. In his address, the Minister of Education, Adamu Adamu, who was represented by the Executive Secretary, Nigerian Educational Research and Development Council, Professor Ismail Junaidu, while applauding the organizers, called for the expansion of the book fair. I wish to also urge you to expand your annual regional book fair to all the zones in the country. This will make your impact felt across the lands and breadth of the nation. The director of the Book Development Center, NERDC, Dr. Eleri Nanna, while delivering the keynote address on behalf of Pastor Junaidu, spoke on the theme of the conference. The critical importance of books and the book industry in national development calls for appropriate regulatory system to be put in place to ensure that the book industry functions optimally for the production and distribution of quality good books in Africa. After the conference was the official tour of the exhibition stands. Day two of the conference began with a tertiary education summit, the first of its kind at the Nigeria International Book Fair. The keynote of the summit was presented by the Vice Chancellor, the University of Benin, Professor Lilian Salami. When I talked about the challenges, I classified them into two. And I said one internal and one external. So we have our own internal issues that we must also correct if we must lead the education system to where it ought to be. So it's, it's either way. So there is no win-win for everyone. You have to come at your own way and then the other person comes. So that at the end of the day, we get you know, what we really desire as a nation, to have you know, quality tertiary education. The children were not left out at the fair as several competitions were organized for them. And winners were given certificates and prizes. Some of the children also visited the exhibition stands to shop for books. Participants at the book fair shared their experiences. It has been an excellent experience. I think the government is very supportive in promoting literacy out here and uh, I'm meeting a lot of people, there are a lot of schools which are coming out here so I believe there's a good promotion which is going on for the fair and uh, I think that's, that's good for the country to grow and to educate the people out here. It's fantastic because this one is much more better than the previous ones. The event is fantastic and um, I think it has to do more with giving children creative minds about many things, generally. The 2023 NIBF, which covered workshops and panel discussions organized by and for key stakeholders in the book industry, was attended by over 24,000 participants 
including booksellers, government representatives, educationists, book publishers and children, amongst others. This is where we have to end the show today. As always, we'll be delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. Visit our Twitter handle, send a tweet, send us an email, go to our Instagram page or Facebook page and drop a comment, a question, an inquiry, or even a criticism. We'd like to hear them all so that we can keep improving. We'll be very delighted to hear from you. My name is Olakunle Kasumo. Remember... One great book can change your life. Bye-bye.